Let's talk about Married Women's Property Acts and also women's capacity to retain their own property. By the 1830s, certainly by the 1840s, uh, women are beginning to talk about yep. the question of, you know, isn't there something that can be done? And by the end of the 1840s, we know that New York State has passed at least the beginning right. uh, of mm -hmm. married women's. Talk to us a little bit about this kind of legislation and how it began to emerge. I would say it begins with both the restiveness of women their better education, their greater ability to articulate their needs uh, to each other um, in print, and also their greater involvement in large national issues. So by the 1830s, we are starting to find women of often of faith who uh, articulate a position on temperance, on the ability of men to drink themselves out of house and home and, and use up the family resources frivolously, women who can articulate a position on slavery and its, uh, the traumas of slavery and why they disprove of it, who can sign massive petitions against slavery and find that Congress puts them on the table. And in that fight in Congress over women's anti-slavery petitions, the son of Abigail Adams stands up in Congress and says, a woman has a moral right to speak on anything that she believes is appropriate for her to think about. He is the son of a woman who had written to her husband, everybody knows the line in your new code of laws, remember the ladies, what they do not remember is the next sentence. And the next sentence is, put it out of the power of our husbands to use us as they will. Remember all men would be tyrants if they could. And John Quincy Adams knows that all men would be tyrants if they could, and he speaks that on behalf of women for the first time, really, in the halls of Congress. Um, so we are getting women, uh, not all women, for the most part, most virtually all, many white women, but then white women who start to hear the voices of enslaved women who are also articulate and remember that there's a lot of slavery in the North. So these people, all many of them knew someone who was enslaved and they heard those voices also. And so I think it would be fair to say that they gain or many of them gain a public voice and find a way to make public claims on behalf of others and then also on behalf ultimately of themselves. So this is fascinating. We've done a lot of talking about the um, relationship between emerging women's rights movements and the movement against slavery, uh, the abolitionist movement. But we haven't linked that to coverture in, in any realistic way. Uh, let's talk about that a little yeah. bit, and perhaps we can focus on the Declaration of Sentiments uh, that came out of the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention, and then some of the subsequent declarations where women actually take on coverture mm -hmm. or <laughs> Do they take it on? I think Can they you? do. I think they do. And I think that one of the key experiences for many women would be women who come to an ability to articulate uh, their wrongs, the wrongs of slaves, to f when they find that they are silenced. So the, the, the most famous case, of course, is Sarah and Angelina Grimke, Grimke right. who grow up in South Carolina who uh, moved to Philadelphia, uh, who articulate the voice of 
women who had really lived in a slave society in a fiercely enslaved household and can testify from their own experience uh, as women of faith that they believe that all women have a responsibility to think about the slave and improve the slave's situation and are told they cannot speak to mixed audiences and that that's inappropriate for women to speak to mixed audiences. And, and they are furious. <laughs> They're just furious. Right. Um, and that's, it's worth mentioning. Go back to the period of the revolution and why we don't have some of this kind of public posture by women in the era of the revolution itself. The only women who had ever spoken in a room with men and women in it were Quaker women. Because you rise in Quaker meeting and you speak your voice. And in no other faith did any woman speak in public or the equivalent. They have an experience that they can teach other women. They can speak in public. Lucretia Mott can speak in public because she's been doing it all her life. And I think we, we see that um, uh, experience coming together. So the critique of the constraints of, of coverture, uh, which permit domestic violence, and these women have experienced it, um, the uh, fretfulness about the economy, the concern for slaves and other people who need a concern so all come together. And while this is going on in the United States, of course, uh, American women are conscious of what's going on in the rest of the world. I've always thought that that is an element of the uh, f fact of having the Seneca Falls Manifesto written in 1848. I always thought that was an aspect of it that had been neglected. Gerda Lerner, uh, the, the great historian Gerda Lerner, uh, caught that in, in a very insightful essay in which essentially she says it's not an accident that Seneca Falls uh, is, the, the gathering at Seneca Falls happens in 1848 because that's the year of the great democratic revolutions all over Europe in which people are also articulating uh, claims on their own behalf.